pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Hey guys, got a fantastic show for you today. I am speaking with Professor Ellen Langer. Ellen has been a professor at Harvard for over 40 years. She's the recipient of four Distinguished Science Awards. She also received the Liberty Science Genius Award. She's considered the mother of mindfulness and the mother of positive psychology. But she's written more books and more articles than that can be mentioned on this show because this is only like a 45 minute show. But you need to Google Ellen Langer after, after, after you listen to the show. Uh, this is a great show. You're going to love it. Super smart lady with some super interesting takes on how to live our lives better. All right, guys, this is the podcast with Dr. Ellen Langer. So, Professor Langer, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. My pleasure, Tim. So you have been called the mother of mindfulness, and I think you could also be called, and I don't want to say this in a a negative way, but the mother of mindlessness. Sure. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Two two children, twins. Yes, yes. Um, Could you share with us what is mindfulness or what is mindlessness? Okay, well, mindlessness is the more familiar to people. It's when the past is over determining the present for us. We're essentially acting like robots. You know, we have general understandings of this, like the lights on, but nobody's home. But the interesting thing is after 40 years of research, it's clear that virtually all of us are mindless almost all the time. It's very scary. Because we're not aware when we're not there, because we're not there to know. Um, but um, the way that um, people become aware, you know, you might be driving and you're intending to get off the highway at, let's say, exit 23, and you look up and you're at exit 28. Well, what happened? You know, uh, or you can't find your keys or um, simple things of that sort. And um, so mindlessness is familiar. It's just, we'll say, acting like a robot. Um, mindfulness, as we study it, is the very simple process of actively noticing new things. When you actively notice new things, so you think you know something, um, since everything is always changing and looks different from different perspectives, you don't really know it. And so when you attend to the things you thought you knew and you find new ways of looking at it, your attention naturally goes to it. You have lots of people who give advice be in the present and that's sweet, but it's meaningless essentially, because when you're not there, you don't know that you're not there. Mm -hmm. So the way to be there is this act of noticing. And so the the more you do this, you know, the more you, let's say if you walked outside today and noticed three new things about the street in which you live, uh, in the house, the person you live with, three or five new things and so on, you come to see that everything is new. And as soon as you recognize that you just can't be sure of anything, and that's an exciting thing for everything to be new, then you naturally do this. Uh, But the way to get yourself there is this very simple process of active noticing. And when you're actively noticing, the neurons are firing, and it turns out that it's literally and figuratively enlivened. So it feels good and it's good for you. People just have to realize how much of their lives are spent on autopilot to, to try something new. Would, would you say actively noticing, is that similar to being uh, curious or having curiosity well, about your you day? Know, yeah, that's a good question. Curiosity seems like it's mindful, uh, but um, curiosity has an endpoint. Mindlessness, mindfulness doesn't. So if you're, you know, let's say you've spilled hot chocolate on a newspaper and you say, um, I wonder what that is. I think it's an R. You know, well, then you find out it is an R and that's the end of the game. But so when you're mindful, um, since everything is changing, that very thing that you were curious about is going to become something different. So being curious is better than not being curious. You know, the worst state is believing you know. If you knew what I was going to say next, why, why pay any attention to me? Right. So it's when you recognize that you don't know that life becomes more exciting. That is awesome. Uh, so, I, and I got to tell you, I think you've been the voice I've been searching for for the last 20 years. I, 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 I wish I'd found you 20 years ago, but I'll take How today. How old are you, Tim? You look young. I'm 46. Oh, okay. Good for you. Um, right. 
it turns out, I guess I use my mind in a lot of the ways you talk about in counterclockwise, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I wrote this book and I, I introduced it with, I, I think a lot of times people get stuck in their framework um, based off of their labels and their definitions. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that you are really good at helping people reframe their framework. Um, <laughs> sure. how, well, the, how, how do you do main, that? Yeah, well, the main thing is once you realize that everything can be understood in multiple ways. And the way to understand that is you just, take situations and intentionally reframe them. And again, you do that often enough, you see, well, you know, um, perspectives matter, uh, not just perspectives at one time where you and I might have a different perspective on something, but that over time, that also changes. And so um, the way to reframe is simply to ask yourself, how else might it be? You know, in schools, kids are taught to find single answers to questions. And I think, so we learn how to be mindless very early on. And I think that we should always be looking for multiple answers. When is this thing true that everybody thinks is not true? When is it not true when everybody thinks it is true? And so, and the more answers you give, the more it becomes clear to you that uh, you can't be certain of any specific answer. So let's say in a stress, when people are stressed, two things happen. They believe that something is going to happen and that when it happens, it's going to be awful, but we can't predict. So if you simply said to yourself, what are three reasons, five reasons, you know, the number is immaterial. Let's say, what are three reasons that this thing might not happen? So now you went from uh, thinking this thing is going to happen to realize it may and it may not. Then let's assume it happens. Now, what are three, five ways this thing might actually be an advantage for you? And so you went from this terrible thing is definitely going to happen to this thing may or may not happen. And if it happens, there's a way for me to look at it that's actually to my advantage. And then obviously the stress would dissipate. So it's just getting used to the world of multiple. You know, I was just talking to somebody right before um, uh, our podcast, your podcast began. And um, the person was saying something about this or that. I, the context is unimportant. And I said, well, I live in an and world. And I think that um, that would be fun for people to, to switch from an or to an and, see how everything can be accommodated. You know, you go for, and you want um, an ice cream cone and you can't decide, should I get a chocolate chip or coffee? And so get two scoops. You can't afford two scoops, ask them to give you a half of each. But our needs can be better met when we live in an and rather than an or, an or world. So there you go. I love that. And I want to get back to that. But first, I, so can I ask, are you, you use questions then to create a world of possibility? Yeah, yeah, um, more or less. I mean, I think that you can answer, but as long as those answers are multiple answers and you recognize that that answer will change depending on the, the circumstances, the context. One thing I, I often do when I give lectures um, to persuade people of how mindless they are, I ask a simple question, Tim, how much is one in one? Answer, Tim, how much it's, is one in one? <laughs> to, right now it's two. <laughs> okay, good for you. <laughs> well, that's what we thought, but it turns out one in one isn't always two. If you were gonna add one pile of laundry to one pile of laundry, one plus one is one. Uh, one um, watt of chewing gum to one watt of chewing gum, one plus one is one. So in the real world, one plus one often doesn't equal two. Not only that, but two is the answer when you're using a base 10 number system. If you're using a base two number system, one plus one is written as 10. And the, the point of that, the takeaway from that is that um, all of the absolutes we have need to be made more conditional, need, need to be um, understood better as much of the time, some of the time, not all of the time. So when you think you know again, you know, one and one is two, you don't pay any attention. When you know that one and one is not necessarily two, then you look to the circumstances. Well, what is she talking about? And then you see I'm talking about piles of laundry, for example. 
and then you change your answer depending on the context. But you that don't then go about thinking that the answer to how much is one and one is one all the time. Nothing is anything all the time, okay, essentially. That things change and our mindlessness holds things still. So, yeah. and when we do that, we hold things still to get control over things. But uh, what we're actually doing is giving up control because the fact of the matter is it's changing. And then we confuse the stability of our mindsets with the stability of the underlying phenomena. You can hold it still if you want, uh, but you're going to come up short. So um, as essentially that when we open our minds to recognize these changes, everything becomes much more exciting people become more exciting. You know, when you think you've got this person down pat, uh, the relationship can get old. When you recognize how they're changing, then the relationship becomes exciting again. That's powerful. I mean, it almost sounds like, kind of like you're saying, trying to hold things still to control them is also like dying. It's like death. Whereas yes. yeah. if you're open, you're living. Yes, I think so. I think that um, when you're um, not being mindful, the system body is turning itself off. Um, and the, the joy of all of this is that drawing these distinctions feels good. It's what you do when you're engaged in a task. You, know, you fall in love, you start, you, know, you start some new activity that you really like, even beginning a crossword puzzle, you know, uh, if you like playing with words. Um, it becomes fun. Mindfulness is fun and it's energy begetting, not consuming. So it's good for you, it feels good. It turns out uh, the things that we produce when we're mindful uh, versus mindless are uh, better appreciated when they're mindful. So our mindfulness leaves its imprint in the things that we do. Um, we wear our mindfulness. So we have lots of research that shows when people are more mindful, they're seen as charismatic, trustworthy, authentic. So given that it feels so good and that it's so good for us in so many ways, it seems to me um, uh, odd or disadvantageous or sad uh, when people don't employ what's so easy and right before them. That's awesome. Um, can, can I ask you a question about your wonderful world of no. and? <laughs> Please? Sure. So, so in the wonderful world of and, um, yeah. How do absolutes of good and bad get us in trouble? Well, um, that's not really the world of and. That's the, the world it, recognizing that um, events, consequences, don't have uh, valence to it. Things are not good or bad. We make them good or bad. And so if you experience something and you see it as bad, you're going to suffer. You're going to be afraid that it's going to happen again, you know, and so on. If you take that very same thing and um, reframe it so that it's an advantage, obviously, then you're going to feel better. You know, if you and I were going, I use this example probably too often, but if you and I were going to go out for lunch and the food was great, wonderful, it's a hit. If you and I go out for lunch and the food is awful, wonderful, I won't eat as much. Okay, so I won't gain weight or that'll make me hungrier and more appreciative of dinner, or, you know, what have you. And the point is, whatever happens, you know, I had this event occur many, many years ago. Um, I came home from a dinner at a friend's house um, at 11.30 at night and all my neighbors were outside and my house had uh, gone up in smoke. I lost 80% of what I owned. And, you know, so that seems like a terrible, terrible event, right? Um, and um, I stayed at the Charles Hotel while my house was being fixed and it was Christmas. And uh, so all the presents that I had bought for others were burned, presents that came in were burned, you know, everything destroyed. Anyway, I went out Christmas Eve and I came back to the room and the room was full of gifts, not from the owner of the hotel, not from the manager, but from the wrongly called little people, the people who parked my car, who served me dinner, the chambermaids. It was, it was beautiful. And I must say, Tim, that I have no idea any longer about the things that were burned. 
But this story about how kind people were um, fills me up, uh, certainly every Christmas, but every time I tell the story, which is why I, I like to tell it. You know, so that would seem a terrible, and I'm not saying that one should wish for a fire, but what I'm saying is that there's, there's always something that's happening. You know, that um, if, um, uh, if this podcast, for instance, right now, got screwed up in some way, you know, you'd probably say, oh, nuts, you know, whatever. Um, but then you'd call me back and we'd do it again. And then instead of the 45 minutes together, we'd have uh, an hour and a half together, you know, or whatever time, uh, get to know each other better. You know, there's always a way of looking at things so that um, it's at least neutral. But the main point is that the event is not positive or negative. So if you keep talking, I'm probably going to purposefully ruin this podcast. Um, <laughs> okay, do it. So, do, and by the way, do you find that Christmas follows you wherever you go? <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, but sure. <laughs> I have a hard time imagining that wherever you go, like whatever lunch you and I were to have, it would always uh, be a great lunch. Um, oh, whatever okay. situation yes. you find yeah, yourself no, in. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that I'm probably hard to live with because I, I'm basically always happy. You know, I wake up yes. happy um, and, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that people's unhappiness largely derives from their um, illusion of predictability. So they're worried that this or that thing is going to happen. And um, I know that we don't know what's going to happen. And also that whatever happens, we'll be able to understand in a way that's good. You know, um, I'm doing my teaching during the pandemic on Zoom. Um, I love it, you know, that I'm a foot away from people rather than on a stage where I just see a sea of faces. Um, you know, when I have a, a room full of 100 people, 100 students, I don't know their names, but in Zoom, I see Tim Anderson. I don't have to worry about, you know, forgetting your name. There it is reminding me. Um, I also am wearing slippers right now rather than shoes, um, but the audience can't see. You know, there are lots of advantages. Uh, so, and I think that in, during this time, for instance, that I enjoy cooking, but now I've been doing a lot of experimenting in the kitchen. And aside from that leading me to eat too much, um, it's been great fun. You know, so I think that, again, no matter what the circumstance, there's a way to enjoy it. My view. Yes, no. Um, and you mentioned you're always happy. Uh, I, I Virtually. I mean, I'm human, you know. <laughs> yes. Well, okay. So, but I teach, a, I teach a movement system. I'm basically, like, I believe that we're all designed to move well and be strong throughout our lives. And I believe that we're designed to be happy. Um, and our joy is attached to how we move and how we move is often attached to our joy, but everything dances together. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody truly just like the one thing everybody wants is they want to be happy. They want to feel good and they want to be happy, but not everybody is happy. Right, right. <laughs> and you, you alluded to that is, is the reason just because why, why, why can't people experience the same type of happiness that you do? Is, is it because oh, they're no, mindless? I, no, no, no. They certainly can. I mean, that's the reason that I'm doing this podcast that I write the books that I do, you know, to try to persuade people to live their lives so that they're full. I mean, right now, I think um, people are sealed in unlived lives. I was gonna write a book many years ago um, uh, where there are people who are talking about life after death. And this book was gonna be about, is there life before death? Mm. You know, and, and sadly for too many people, um, there is no life because they're worried, worried about the future that they again can't predict. You know, let me tell you one other thing about this predictability because um, it's a hard concept since everything we do is based on our assumptions that we can predict. I did this with my advanced um, decision class at Harvard, my graduate class. So there are 12 students there, <coughs> excuse me, and I asked them, <clears throat> I said, to them, I've, teach, uh, I've been teaching a version of this course for 40 years. I've never missed a class. What is the likelihood that I'm going to be here next week? So let me go around the room. And they all say things that approximate 
students. I, they're Harvard students. They don't say 100, they say 99, 96. I, I don't know how they're doing the calculation, but essentially it's all 100%. Then I say, okay, now I want us to go around the room and I want everybody to give me a good reason why I might not be here. And the first person always says, well, you've been here for 40 years. You feel you deserve the time off. The next person says, your dog has to go to the vet. The next person says, on the way to, um, to the office, to school, I got a flat tire. And they go on and they all give good reasons. And then I say to them, okay, so what is the likelihood I'm going to be here next week? And now 100% drops to 50%. Okay, so we're very good at post-dicting. After something has happening, happened, looking back and seeing how it makes perfect sense. That's very different from going forward. Um, you know, you see two people fighting at a party, so they fight, everybody fights on occasion, it's no big deal. Um, then you see, you find out that those two people are now getting a divorce, or if they're younger, they're breaking up. And you say, ah, I knew because they fought, you know. Um, anyway, so uh, once we recognize we can't predict, and we recognize that we don't need to predict, because we can make it so we're virtually okay with no matter what happens, then we can just be, which I strongly recommend. Just being. Just being. I, I, I love that. I, I recommend it. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I, okay, I gotta ask you this. Uh, the mind and the body, can you, can you or should you, are they separate? Okay. <laughs> um, to my mind, no that mind-body dualism has been around for uh, since Descartes. And um, the problem with mind-body dualism is it raises the question, how do you get from a fuzzy thought to something material, the body? And not being able to figure out that pathway has prevented people from taking advantage of all sorts of things uh, that go away once you put the mind and body back together. It's one unit, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> wherever you put the mind, you're necessarily putting the body. And so we did lots of studies where we put the mind in unusual places and take the measurements from the body. Uh, it's uh, the flip side of what you were saying before with movement that you know, when, you know, if mind and body are one, then where you put the mind is effect is the same as the body and where you put the body is obviously going to um, affect the mind, but not two things where this is leading to this, you know, seeing it as one. So the first study we did, it's, I, it's a famous study. I can call my own study famous because it's actually described on the Simpsons go to Havana. Um, so uh, anybody who, who wants more detail than I'm going to give now, but a very simple study. What we did was we retrofitted a timeless retreat so that it appeared to be 20 years earlier. And we had elderly men live there for a week as if they were their younger selves. So they spoke about past events in the present tense. As a result of this, the hearing improved, their vision improved. Now ask yourself, when have you ever heard a 90 year old's hearing or vision improve, even with medical intervention, um, it doesn't happen. But this is without medical intervention. Their strength improved, their memory improved. And we took photographs of everybody before we started and then had those rated by people who knew nothing about the study at the study's end. They also looked noticeably younger. So that was the beginning of all of this mind-body unity. And then we have many studies, which would take us a long time. So you can pick one of them and ask me about it if you'd like, or we can go on to something else. What's your, your most, show, Tim. What's it? No, this is your show. What is, what is your most, to you, what was your most fascinating study? Like what oh. really lit your Christmas tree up? Yeah, no, um, my Christmas tree gets lit up constantly. You know, I have an <laughs> idea, it's exciting, I do it. And then that's the, you know, that's the excitement for the day. But one that, um, well, I'll tell you two of them, okay? But there, there are many. So one was a, a study we did with chambermaids. Now chambermaids exercise all day long, but they don't see themselves as getting exercise because they think exercise is what you do after work. Okay. Now we take the chambermaids and all we do is teach them that their work is exercise, nothing else. 
just to see that their work is exercise. You know, working, making a bed is like working at this or that machine at the gym and so on. So we have two groups. One now sees their work as exercise, the other doesn't. Um, the groups didn't increase in the amount of effort they put into their work. They didn't work longer, harder. They didn't eat any differently. The only difference was that this group now believed their work was exercise. As a result of that, they lost weight. Uh, there was a change in waist to hip ratio, body mass index, and their blood pressure came down just from this change of mindset. Now we go fast forward. We're just about to publish this study. This one is wild, or maybe I should wait until we do publish it and tell you about one that's, oh, I'll tell you about it. That's a cliffhanger. <laughs> so what we did, people would come in uh, to the lab, they'd get all sorts of tests. Then the experimental subjects, one at a time, would go into a room, it's a large screen, uh, and they would watch, uh, see a TV, I mean, a, a video of people coughing and sneezing uh, who are clearly sick. The room has, is surrounded with um, primes for a cold, chicken soup, tissues, Vaseline, whatever we could think of. Um, and the question we were asking is, without the introduction of a virus, would people get sick? And the short answer is yes. Mm. We have people in a sleep lab. Uh, they wake up, they see a clock that says they got two hours more or two hours fewer or the amount of sleep they actually got and their behavior followed perceived amount of sleep. Um, you know, their cognitive and biological functioning followed perceived sleep. I'll tell you one more and then I'm not gonna tell you the rest. Yes, ma'am. That's, that's a lot of them, okay. Um, so we have people show up who have type two diabetes. And again, everybody's given all sorts of tests. Now they're asked to play computer games um, and there's a clock, oh, this will make sense, the end of the story. There's a clock next to the computer and, for, and they're told, we want you to change the game you're playing every 15 minutes or so. That's just to ensure that they'll look at the clock. For a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's half as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's real time. And the question we're asking is, does blood sugar level follow real or perceived time? And it turns out, it follows perceived time. And the bottom line to, to all of these studies and a host of other studies and a slightly uh, different domain of attention to symptom variability, what we find is we have enormous control over our health um, and well being that most people haven't begun to tap. And that is why you are the voice <laughs> I have been looking for for over half my life. So it's kind of like you're saying that the mind is like the tip of the spear and where it goes, the spear, every, the body um, sure. follows. Yeah. I, I don't like the metaphor so much because spears are usually used to hurt people. I, I like to but, use nerve spears. They're minor nerve. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're just for fun. Um, wow. Uh, so you mentioned attention to symptom variability yes <laughs> so in today's in today's world yeah with with the covid virus and and all the information or the misinformation that is programming because like uh, we we get programmed based off of what we take in right um okay. and without being able to reframe that program or being not mindful enough to reframe mm -hmm. it how does that lead how can that lead to people getting sick or being afraid or all the stuff that could happen. Well, no, I think that follows quite clearly from all that I'm saying, you know, that if you um, believe you're going to become ill, uh, first, uh, all that negativity, all that stress is going to increase the chances that you're going to become sick. You, know, you become more vulnerable to everything when you're stressed. So um, that's the, the first, probably the most important thing. I think that um, with COVID, that if people wear a mask, wash their hands, are sensible about social distancing, the likelihood of anything happening is very small. And then even if it happens, the likelihood of it uh, having dramatic consequences is also small. So there are things that we can do. 
Um, I wrote about this thing called, many people have an attitude of defensive pessimism, which I think should be replaced with mindful optimism. So defensive pessimism is um, you expect the worst and hope for the best. Uh, that's problematic in two ways. You tend to get what you expect first, so that's harmful. And hope, no, it's interesting. Hope is one of those words that sounds like a good thing. Um, and it's better than being hopeless, but hope carries with it a, an expectation for failure. You don't wake up in the morning and walk to the kitchen and say, I hope I can get a cup of coffee. You just assume you're gonna get Right. So by having this uh, attitude of defensive pessimism, you're in a state of worry that hurts the system, makes you more vulnerable. And instead of this, I say we should um, have an attitude of mindful optimism where you don't put your head in the sand. You, you know, as I said before, you follow and you, know, you make a plan. So for me, my plan is I wear a mask when I'm outside. I wash my hands frequently. I maintain a certain social distance. And then you just get on with your lives. And by getting on with your life and actually living moment to moment, you're building up the resources so that even if you should end up getting sick, you're much stronger um, and in a better position to deal with whatever happens. A, a, a simple, uh, you know, another little take to add to that is perhaps uh, no worry before it's time. You know, that most things that you worry about don't end up happening. So you've wasted all that time. And the worry doesn't actually help you deal with whatever is going to happen. So um, best to recognize you can predict, uh, make a plan for yourself and then just be. And um, so there you have it. So instead of getting up in the morning and hoping it's going to be a great day. Just make it a great you just, day. You just make it a great yeah. day. And you know, it's interesting, this sounds sort of hallmark and I don't, I don't know how to say it. So it sounds as profound as, you know, as I feel it, it could be. Um, but that life only consists of moments. That's all it is. And so if you can make the moment matter, then at the end of the day, the whole day has mattered. And, um, you know, it's much easier when you wake up instead of saying, how am I gonna make this entire day work out for me, how am I gonna make right now work? You know, and so you go and you have your coffee and let's say that um, you ran out of milk. So then you try it without milk and you say, oh, you know, I don't really need milk. It's still kind of uh, tasty and serves its purpose. Um, and, or you get dressed and you go buy some milk. You say, oh, it's nice taking a walk early in the morning, you know, and so on, um, but moment to moment. Um, and I'm sure you're aware, uh, Hallmark makes a lot of money sounding yeah. like Hallmark. And, yeah, and, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to disparage Hallmark. <laughs> oh, no, I'm um, not saying you did. I'm just no, saying. No, I, but I did. I did. No, all I meant was that, you know, it, it sounds like a nice homey statement. Um, but I think there's a lot, you know, that it it's, doesn't sound so different from being the moment, which I myself took apart before. I said, be mindful, notice new things that'll put you in the moment. Um, but uh, the recognition that at the end of the day, all you had was, uh, you know, all of these moments that add up and it's very easy to, to make yourself enjoy the moment. You know, what am I going to do next year? I don't, what am I going to do when the pandemic's over? I don't know, you know, um, but I know what I'm doing right now. And if what I'm doing right now is fun for me, if I'm doing it mindfully, which I am having this fun time with you, Tim then it was time well spent. Yes, ma'am, this is awesome. Um, can, what, is, what is the difference between asking how can I versus yes. can I? I'm glad you've done your homework. Have you read everything I've written? I, I try to be a good student. <laughs> well, um, this is one of the things I teach people is that you should be asking how to do something. Um, and then you look around and if you do do it and it doesn't work that way, then you do it another way. And you, you keep trying, you know, people mistakenly think that they want everything to work perfectly. 
you know, and that's equivalent to, I mean, there, there's no there there. You know, if I play golf and I get a hole in one every time I uh, swing the club, there's no game. So, you know, people need to understand that those errors are momentary and uh, allow for the possibility of a feeling of mastery, which is much more important than having mastered. Now, if you ask yourself, can you do something? If you've never done it before, you have no evidence that you can do it, it's too easy to conclude that you can't. And, um, and then people don't. Rather than just how would you do it? And you just start doing it. And, um, and then it can become fun and meaningful and turn into something that you wanna continue doing. Or to start something doesn't mean you have to continue it. But you, when you discontinue, you don't wanna discontinue because you've wrongly concluded that you can't. We can never know that we can't. All we can know is the possibility that the way we tried uh, didn't work. Wow. On that note, because that's a powerful, uh, that's a powerful way to end. We can never know that we can't. Thank you so much for, for your time. This is, this has been wonderful. Um, I'm going to put all the, your books, all the notes into the show, uh, so people can find your work, uh, which is life-changing. Um, because really what you're talking about, everything you're saying, like it resonates with, with truth, but it seems like a, you're a fresh breath of life. I mean, no. and it's, it's just really awesome to, to hear someone talk about how you can reframe and really you can reframe your experience or your reality based off right. of based off of how you uh think or how you notice right good well tim this was fun i wish you well i Stay wish you safe. well yes ma'am thank you so much thanks for listening everyone have a great weekend